this Christmas, according to the quadrilineal bloody moons of the tetraarchal clap the larkin and alignment of the 15th Buddha popper based on the signs in the heavens in Revelation 12 and the woman in the sky, the third primordial rapture palooza will definitely magically occur just after September 23rd, 2017. This is definitely when the end of the world will magically occur and the seven year tribulation period will magically begin with the invasion of the magical bugs from the magical bottomless pit and the two magical fire breathing prophets shall magically appear in Jerusalem. We know this is going to be the case because the end of the world did not magically happen in 2012 like it was supposed to magically happen and that was only because the Lord delayed his wrath and fury because I had scheduled a vacation to the Bahamas and the godless liberals that run those things said it was non-refundable. Thanks to the good Lord's mercy, however, I was able to still take my Bahamas vacation, which was very edifying to me and my wife. But this temporary displacement of the factualoid quadrilateral bloody moon of the tetraarchal clap de larkin, spatulocker, and the alignment of the 15th Buddha popper, based on the signs in the heavens in Revelation 12 and the woman in the sky, definitely indicate the publication of another book of mine and a new series of $50 per person church seminars and possibly another Caribbean vacation for me and my wife. But I would like to say officially that this is not anything prophetic as there are no such thing as prophets today. So while this is definitely indicating that the third primordial rapture palooza will definitely occur, I cannot officially say because that would make me a prophet and I would have to raise the admission charges to my exciting prophetic seminars. I know $50 is already pretty steep for most people who are working minimum wage jobs, but I have been told the market could bear possibly five more dollars, which I would definitely have to charge if I were right. But the main thing is that you need to buy my $30 book and attend my $50 seminar and purchase the $100 series of CDs that go along with the seminar that explain my newest book on the quadrilateral bloody moon of the tetraarchal claptolarkin and the alignment of the 15th Buddha popper based on the signs in the heavens in Revelation 12 and a woman in the sky, which as you will discover in my exclusive $50 per person church seminars is ex and my sweet darling wife. But that's a secret I wasn't supposed to tell you outside of my $50 seminar, which is explained in my new $30 book as advertised on my $100 CD series, which if you order now will come along with a very, very, very special autograph picture of me holding my new book as was advertised on the Christian TV channel TBN along with the lady in the pink hair. Anyways, just so you'll know, this is all based on my latest new calibration of the quadrilateral bloody moons of the tetraarchal clap de larkin and the alignment of the 15th Buddha popper based on the signs in the heavens in Revelation 12. As you may be aware by now, there is nothing in Revelation chapter 12 about September 23rd, 2017 being the end of the world. Nor is there anything about the rapture. Nor is there anything about an imaginary seven-year tribulation period, in which everything bad in the Bible, can be arbitrarily thrown into. But the fact they have finally figured out, there is at least something in the sky, that has to do with the book of Revelation, that is a major breakthrough for them. Unfortunately it is a breakthrough that, will in the end, do them little good. Because of the fact, the rapture is a manufactured doctrine, and it is just not in the Bible. Consequently, they could keep re-prophesying the rapture based on signs in Revelation, until the end of the universe, and it will still never happen, because it is not something that is actually there, in the biblical texts, to begin with. It is a non-reality. You cannot accurately predict something, that is never going to happen. That is, unless you predict, 
it is never going to happen, which is precisely what this channel predicts every year. And every year, this channel has been 100% correct. In the 200 years, the Counter-Reformation has been pushing Rapture Doctrine, currently the score is, Rapturism equals 0%, Historicism equals 100%. That's a pretty good record, wouldn't you say? Would you really want to risk your eternal salvation on something that has a track record that bad? That is precisely what a lot of people are actually doing, without even realizing it. The odds of your soul, being saved based on the theology of rapturism, is precisely the same, as well. On your screen, is an article that appeared in Science Magazine. The article is a discussion about the results of a study done on the spread of lies, versus the spread of truth. The study discovered that lies in social media will often spread to 100,000 people, but the truth will rarely ever spread beyond 1,000. The next article from New Scientists, notes that not only do lies spread farther than the truth, by almost a 10 times margin, lies spread 6 times faster. If you are a person of truth, this information is no surprise to you. You have already observed this in your daily experience for years. People are magnetically drawn to deceit, like flies are to honey. But when they are faced with the real truth about something, they rarely seem to have any interest in it. And unfortunately this is especially often true with people who claim to be Christians. In many ways, they are often actually the worst of all. Not only do they seem to believe in lies quicker, they spread them with more dishonesty and zeal than the average person. And this can be a very discouraging thing to see. Until you realize, that there is something spiritual going on, with these people. There is something uniquely spiritual about people who think of themselves as Christians, and who gravitate toward belief in lies and spread them with more zeal and callous, than even an average atheist. The spiritual dimension of Christian delusion, is found in a prophecy about future Christians, who would be followers of the Antichrist, found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Naturally, Christians who follow the Antichrist, would never admit that is what they are doing. So they delude themselves, with excuses and alternative realities, which they prefer to call theology. But if you are a bank robber, you don't hide your crime behind a set of excuses you call a theology. Yet somehow, that is precisely what these kinds of people manage to do. Counter-Reformation Rapture Theology, was an excuse theology. It gave people who wanted to be considered Christian, the excuses they needed, to ignore all the warnings in the scripture about the Antichrist. And that is precisely how they ended up following him. Worshipping his image and lately even taking his mark. The New Testament offers no promises of salvation for people who do that. In fact, to the contrary, it is quite clear, that the consequence of those choices, will not end in salvation. So when Christians endorse counter-reformation rapture theology, they do so at a great risk to themselves spiritually. But they are never told up front, that that is the risk, they are placing themselves in. These excuses are presented as a theology, like the flavor of an ice cream, you can pick as a consumer choice, with no real consequence. But there is, a very substantial consequence, they are not being told about. And that is how the Counter-Reformation, routinely violates the principle of informed consent. An informed consent, is something, Counter-Reformation theology, obviously can never do. Without completely invalidating itself. The whole point of Counter-Reformation theology, is to bypass informed consent, by creating an intentional deception. And like the lies spread on social media which will travel 10 times farther and 6 times faster than the truth, Counter-Reformation Rapture Theology, has become the most common deception, in all of Christianity. But unfortunately, that is all it is. Unintentional deception. And the intent of the deception is to remove out of the consciousness of biblically focused Christians, the awareness, of the presence of the biblical antichrist, alive and well, in the contemporary modern world today. In order to continue to perpetuate the fraud that is rapture theology, they have to continually issue renewed claims every two or three years, that the rapture is just around the corner because of one thing or another. They have been pulling this trick on the American public for 200 years. And for some reason, gullible Christians who never seem to learn, keep falling for this same old trick, over and over and over again. The latest iteration of this trick, has occurred over Revelation chapter 12. Revelation 12 has nothing to do with the rapture. 
and here is how you can know that is the case. Counter-Reformation Rapture Theology will take three verses from this chapter as ink blots for their free associations, and then ignore everything else in the chapter that is prophesied. Of course they have to ignore everything else because the rest of the chapter clearly demonstrates no rapture occurred. They see the phrase, in verse 5, that states, quote, Her child was caught up unto God, and to his throne. End quote. And immediately begin to go into conniption fits, imagining their images of people flying through the sky up to heaven. Then they proceed to turn everything else in the entire chapter into an ink blot for free associations virtually ignoring all of its actual content. If verse 5 actually did refer to the rapture, then they would have to admit the woman, who gives birth to the child, doesn't get raptured. And the seed of the woman, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Christ, in verse 17, also don't get raptured. In fact, the only person in the whole chapter that gets raptured is one child. Which of course is extremely odd. They try to claim that the people who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Christ are people who convert to Christianity during the tribulation. But the problem with that claim is that rapture theology teaches that the Holy Spirit is removed from the earth at the rapture, and clearly according to the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is what makes conversion to Christ even possible. It is a work of the Holy Spirit called regeneration. No Holy Spirit, no regeneration. So, once you dig past the pet peeve verse in verse 5, there is nothing else there that supports their doctrine. So what is the story with verse 5? It does say the child is caught up to God, doesn't it? Yes it does. But as you saw in the video on this channel, the truth about the rapture, the Greek word is harp itzo, and refers to being caught up into the presence of God, after death. So verse 5 is actually describing the child dying. It is a prophecy about the death of someone or something, as you will clearly see, when we look at the historical fulfillment of this chapter. And there really is no ambiguity about it. In fact, Revelation 12 is such a clear and easily identifiable prophecy, all you really have to do is read it with an open mind, and you will easily see what it is prophesying. When you dig into the Greek, in the text, what is obvious even in English grows even more obvious, exponentially. It will become so obvious, that you will wonder how anyone who has spent any amount of time on the chapter at all, could possibly miss everything, to come up with exactly and precisely the opposite of what the text is actually prophesying. You will once again be left in a state of complete wonder and awe at the actions of the counter-reformationist. Is he really that stupid? Or is he that deceptive? But those two options will be the only two, unbelievable options, left to explain it. And both are honestly hard to believe, in either case. Because of the sheer extreme nature of either option. But those are the only two options available, as tragic as either one of those options are. Because there is nothing ambiguous about this text. A smart fifth grader could read this text in English, and figure out what it refers to in history. But that is the whole problem. Counter-Reformation Rapturists, take everything in the entire book of Revelation, completely out of history. And thus, they also take everything in the book of Revelation completely out of context, because history is its context. They completely ignore the fact, the entire chapter all the way from verse 4 to verse 17, is a prophecy about a war. They have nothing to say about that war. Which actually, not incidentally, constitute a whopping 76% of the entire chapter. Which means they literally ignore what is in 76% of the entire chapter. They also ignore the fact, that the pinnacle of this chapter, prophesying this war, is very explicitly about rivers. They have nothing to say about those rivers. Because there are no major rivers anywhere around Jerusalem. And rivers certainly have nothing to do with a rapture. And they either have no clue why John is talking about mouths of the dragon, or the land, swallowing up those rivers. Or, they have no interest in either finding out what that means, or telling anyone, what they do mean. They have no interest in why Michael is said to be fighting the dragon, or why the dragon is thrown to earth, or why the woman flees to a wilderness to escape the dragon. Or why the woman has refuge from the dragon for a time, in this wilderness. They have no curiosity about this text beyond the phrase in verse 5, the child is caught up to God. And there, they are done with the entire text. They have their bias confirmation. 
and all else becomes irrelevant to them. To call them liars in reference to this text, might be unfair. They might actually be precisely that stupid. It might be that God has blinded them so severely, they can see nothing else in the text but verse 5. But the sad thing about that is, that even though they myopically focus on verse 5, they don't even get the one and only verse, they obsess over, right? Even the one and only verse they obsess over, they somehow manage to even completely mess it up. So in the end, the counter-reformationist rapture theologian walks away completely blind to the entire contents of Revelation chapter 12. They might as well be reading the scribblings on a bathroom stall, and calling it Revelation chapter 12. They are no closer, to the actual content, of Revelation chapter 12, than precisely that. The question is for you as a consumer is, should you really be listening to such uninformed sources, try to explain the book of Revelation to you? The answer to that rhetorical question, should be an obvious one. In the article on your screen entitled, Why Lies Spread Faster Than the Truth, the article points out that one of the characteristics of the truth, is that it will remain consistent with the future. Whereas deception will not. It has to be reinvented, just like the rapture predictions, that keep moving the rapture date, every time they are wrong. Instead of examining why rapture theology always, consistently, fails to accurately predict the future. Rapture theologians have been predicting the rapture is just around the corner, for 200 years since it was introduced into American evangelicalism to dispose of the obvious papal associations, with fulfillment of the prophecies concerning the Antichrist. In the 200 years that they have been making rapture predictions, they have been right 0% of the time. In the same time period, historicism, which predicts there will not be a rapture, has been accurate 100% of the time. So if you are faced with two theological interpretations, one which is right 0% of the time over 200 years, and one which is right 100% of the time over the same 200 years, which of these two theological interpretations has demonstrated itself to be true? The answer to that rhetorical question, should be an obvious one, it is clearly, classic Christian historicism, not the Jesuit hoax theology, of rapturism. And yet despite this undeniable fact, devotees of Jesuit rapturism, will simply keep remaking their rapture prediction dates without ever realizing the extreme arrogance and even blasphemy the theology is causing them to indulge. Rapturists believe that the magical rapture is part of the return of Christ, which after precisely seven years of tribulation, he will physically return to the Earth, but has had two-thirds of it completely destroyed by an asteroid and a global nuclear holocaust, and overrun by zombies. So when they predict their dates for the rapture, they are claiming in essence they know more than God. This is not a theoretical arrogance, this is literal. In Mark 13 verse 32, Christ is reported saying, quote, But concerning that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. End quote. So if even Christ himself does not know, how blasphemous and arrogant is it for these rapturists to claim that they do know? It is literally exalting themselves over Christ himself, which they claim is the second person of the Trinity. How exactly the second God of a three-person God would not know something, when the first person God would, and yet they are said to be the same, is obviously a strange contradiction they never seem to notice either. But their historical track record, is one of absolute, object, failure. They have scored a perfect zero, on their predictions, while classic historicism, has to the contrary, scored a perfect, 100% accuracy. So why do they still insist on it? Because the alternative is emotionally threatening to them. It identifies them as followers and co-laborers of the Antichrist. And they also know, this means according to those same texts in the New Testament, they will not be saved. And this is something emotionally and psychologically, they cannot accept, no matter what the facts of the matter, or the truth may be. It is an absolute unconditional, emotionally based, belief system, that matches perfectly the prophecy in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul prophesies, the coming great delusion, to Christians. Jesuit rapturism, created from its beginning to be a hoax theology, is clearly one very important aspect, of that great delusion.
When we come to Revelation chapter 12, we come to one of the most amazing prophecies in the entire book. Like chapter 9, 10 and 11, it is also one of the most suppressed and obfuscated chapters as well. And when you see what is in it, you will understand why the Counter-Reformation had a major incentive to suppress the knowledge of this chapter, as well, among the public. Before we begin looking at each verse, we have to make a few observations about the actual structure of the chapter itself. When you begin to study this chapter, you will see some rather unusual repetitive patterns in the literary structure of the chapter. The chapter has 17 verses in it, but it is separated into three prophecies. There is a set of five verses constituting the birth of the child. Then there is a set of seven verses about the war with the dragon. And then it is followed by another set of five verses about a river battle involving the woman. So the verses have a strange repetition of five verses then seven verses and five verses again. The war with the dragon is sandwiched in between two sets of five verses on either side, involving three prophecies, adding up to a total of 17 verses. So there is a pattern of 3 times 17, in the way it is structured. But if you look at each of the verses, John makes a point of strangely repeating 3 elements, in each verse. You can go through the entire chapter and see John repeating an unending series of 3's, in each and every verse. Which is really rather odd. People do not naturally write, in this kind of structural repetition. And once again, you will see 3 times 17, even in the way the verses are structured. So 3 times 17, is something John really wanted to bring to the attention, of anyone reading this text. It is very hard to miss. Verse numberings were added much later to the text, but they were based on the already existing grammatical structures of the text. The numberings of verses are for the most part, just the counting of the sentences in the text, for easy reference. So what does 3 times 17 mean? If you look up the meaning of 17, you will discover it is used in the Bible to symbolize victory. So John is stating in this pattern, victory, over what the number 3 represents. So what does the 3 represent? John uses a lot of symbols in the book of Revelation and when you run into a symbol, you can either use it as an ink blot for your free associations, or you can look up what it actually means. First in how the author uses it in his own book and secondly how he draws upon its meaning in scripture, where he would have been referring to its already established usage. Most people, unfortunately, will just play the ink blot free association game with them. But we will actually look them up to see what the author actually says he really means. When we look up John's reference to 3, we will find, later in the book of Revelation, in chapter 16, verses 13 and 14, John writes, Quote, and I saw from the mouth of the dragon, and from the mouth of the beast and from the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are the spirits of devils working signs, and they go forth unto the kings of the whole earth. End quote. They go forth unto the kings of the earth. End quote. That was a reference to the Roman doctrine of the Trinity, which became part of the Edict of Thessalonica in 380 AD and actually really did, literally, go out to all the kings, of the Roman Empire. Which you have already been told about repeatedly in previous videos in this series, and on this channel, dealing with the fulfillment of Paul's prophecy in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In this chapter however, this will be the first time, John brings up the symbol of the dragon. But it will not be the last. He will repeat this symbol 12 times in the book. Outside of the book of Revelation, the word dragon, is only used two other times, in a prophetic way, and both of those references are found in the Old Testament. The first is Jeremiah 51 34 where the prophet Jeremiah writes, quote, Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon has devoured me, he has crushed me, he has made me an empty vessel, he has swallowed me up like a dragon. End quote. Here, Jeremiah uses the symbol of a dragon to describe the king of Babylon. The next symbolic usage occurs in Ezekiel chapter 29 verse 3 where Ezekiel writes, quote, Speak and say thus saith the Lord God. Behold, I am against thee Pharaoh king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers. End quote. Here, the symbol of the dragon is used to describe the Pharaoh of Egypt. In both cases the term is used to describe an empire king. First the king of Babylon and then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. 
John's usage follows the very same pattern of use, where he specifies in chapter 16, that he is talking about kings. So John's use of the term dragon, in Revelation 12, tells us he is prophesying something about an imperial king. The powerful king of an empire, connected to the Roman Empire. And that king is symbolized by the number three, as in the three frog spirits that go out to the kings of the earth, or rather more properly, land. 3 times 17, mathematically, is symbolic for victory, over an imperial king. Which is what the prophecy of Revelation chapter 12 is actually all about. It is the prophecy about the defeat of an imperial king, in a war in which the imperial king had an overwhelming advantage to win. But will not, because of God's hand against him. When you execute the mathematical equation presented in this repeating structure of 3 times 17, it will give you the mathematical value of 51. So what does that mean? What is the significance of 51? 51 will become a recognizable part of John's prophecy in chapter 12. But its actual meaning is interesting as well. 1 is the number for solidarity or unity. 5 is said to be the number for grace, which is a rather odd interpretation for the number 5, since it is most often found associated with law in the Old Testament. That interpretation sounds a lot like someone's theological opposite speech. But if you start digging into the particular usage of the number 5, one of the earliest, most important and most prominent appearances of it occurs in the Abrahamic Covenant. When Abraham's name is changed from Abraham to Abraham, with the addition of the fifth letter in Hebrew to his name. And this is the statement, that God speaks to Abraham, when this is done, in Genesis chapter 17 verse 5. Quote, Neither shall thy name be called any more Abraham, but thou shalt be called Abraham, because I have made thee a father of many nations. End quote. Here is one of the earliest and most visible signs of the number five. It is associated with the Abrahamic covenant, concerning many nations. This use is noted, as one of its most prominent meanings in biblical literature. Five is a reference to the many nations of the Abrahamic covenant. It is a covenant number. So 51 is symbolic for, 5 being many nations and 1 being unity. Or in other words, out of many, 1. But the exact and precise number 51, as you will soon see, is literally, a part of this prophecy, in and of itself. Remember that number 51. And as we noted earlier a full 76% of this chapter is about the war in which this red dragon, associated with the Roman Empire, is defeated. John has created a prophetic message into the very structure of Revelation chapter 12, that is going to echo precisely, what he writes as his prophecy. There will be victory over the imperial king, and out of this victory, will continue to grow God's promise to Abraham, that he will be the father of many nations. Out of this many, will be one. And the sign of this victory in history, will be the number 51. The red dragon will be defeated. John has put an amazing and very intentional mathematical frame around this prophecy, about the defeat of this imperial king. And this prophecy, as you will see, clearly has absolutely nothing to do with the Counter-Reformation's imaginary magical rapture. In fact, John is actually prophesying about them, once again, in this chapter. For the sake of brevity, we will look at the following texts in Revelation chapter 12 from the Lexham English Bible translation. This was a translation created by Logos Bible Software to reflect the Greek text more directly, and is available in the public domain. We will still however, stop and make note of the underlying Greek texts, when it is important to see the full meaning of what has been written. Chapter 12 begins with verse 1 and reads as follows, in the Lexham English Bible translation. Quote, and a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. End quote. John says this is a sign that is in the sky. As you have seen in the previous 36 videos, this is an obvious reference to astronomical information. There are three constellations featuring females. Two of the three however are not in the planetary elliptic. And only one has a circle of twelve stars over its head. That constellation is Virgo. On your screen is a picture of the constellation Virgo. And as you can see, it has a circle of 12 stars over its head. 
The reference to being clothed with the sun and having the moon under its feet is a reference to the September new moon in Virgo. Which is what that looks like precisely as John describes in verse 1. So we will make a note of that in the astronomical column. The second notation which comes from the Greek is that the term translated as crown, is actually the Greek word Stephanos, and is actually a reference to the garland wreath placed on the head given to athletes or soldiers for feats of distinction. Not an actual crown. These garland wreaths were made of many types of vegetation, each type indicating a different thing. The most common were those made of laurel leaves or olive leaves. The type John is referring to here, is the type made of olive leaves. Why is that? Because the olive wreath was the one used to indicate the birth of a male child. And as you will see, in the following verses, that is the subject of the following prophecy. So we have two symbols, first a circle of 12 stars and, secondly, the word olive, which we will put in the symbolic column. Both will be important when we get to the historical fulfillment of these texts. Verse 2 reads as follows, quote, and who was pregnant and was crying out because she was having birth pains, and was in torment to give birth. End quote. This text refers to a time of labor for the woman, which according to medical sources varies based on the period of history one is talking about and birth weight sizes. However the average normal time of labor is about 6 hours. So we will put 6 in the mathematical column. Since we also know he is discussing astronomical information, the child John will be discussing is a reference to the planet Venus because he refers to ruling with a rod of iron in verse 5, which John has already associated with the planet Venus from chapter 2 verse 27 and 28, where he openly associates the expression with the planet Venus as the bright and morning star. The reference to Virgo in the birthing position with the planet Venus passing through the womb of Virgo is an astronomical reference precisely as you see on your screen. John is describing an astronomical dating reference with this information, but it is also part of his prophecy as well. The word translated into English as torment, is literally the word for torture in the Greek. So we will put a reference to Venus in Virgo in the birthing position horizontal in the sky, in the astronomical column, and we will put torture in the historical column. Along with the number 6 we have already placed in the mathematical column. Verse 3 reads as follows, quote, And another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven royal headbands. End quote. Now we have the second part of John's astronomical dating. Not only do we have to see Venus in Virgo, in the horizontal birthing position in the sky, but we also need to see a co-occurrence involving a constellation described as a great fiery red dragon. The Greek word dragon means a large monstrous reptile, and it includes the idea of what we think of as a dragon, but it doesn't stop with that. It can be a very large snake, like a python or a boa constrictor, it can be a large crocodile, etc. That is important because when get to constellations in the sky there are a couple of potential constellations that fit this description. There is one literally called Draco, which means dragon. The only problem is that it is too far off the planetary elliptic, and remember, John stated up front that the seven stars were the angels or messengers to the Ecclesia. Draco is out of reach of any of the seven stars. However, there is another dragon constellation named Hydra and it is sitting right next to Virgo in the sky. And Hydra actually has the seven heads in star lore, that John is referring to. On your screen is a Roman mosaic showing the seven heads of Hydra, in 26 AD. And if you look at the constellation of stars that make up the head of Hydra, you will be able to count the seven stars that John is making reference to, as the seven heads, of the dragon he is describing. But while we can see the seven heads clearly enough, John also adds that there are ten horns. So what are the ten horns? Historically, ten horns would be a reference to the military power of ten generals or ten regions. Horns are symbolic of destructive power in the scripture. But John is also describing astronomical information and it is important that we identify what he is referring to, and his language, in this regard as well. So what are the ten horns of Hydra? Here we see John doing something we have seen him do before astronomically. He has merged the identity of two constellations into a single unit for prophetic dating purposes. Hydra lays just below the line of the planetary elliptic, meaning planets do not actually come into Hydra, but rather just over its head. 
the constellation that lies just over the head of Hydra is Cancer, also known as the Crab. Okay, so what, you might say? Well, crabs have 10 legs, and when you look at the astronomical art in the sky, you can see it fits right over the head of Hydra, just like the 10 horns John is describing. Cancer represents the 10 horns John is talking about. So now we have identified the 7 heads and the 10 horns, but what are the 7 headbands or crowns? This is the moving part of John's astronomical clock. You remember from previous videos that Kronos, the Greek name for Saturn, was the origin of the word crown. And you also remember from our previous discussions in Chapter 10 that the ancient Greeks picture Saturn with seven rings of water displaying each color of the rainbow. Saturn is the seven crowns. So what we are looking for in this astronomical description is Venus in Virgo in the horizontal berthing position, and at the very same time, Saturn and the ten horns of Hydra as John describes it, or in other words, in Cancer above the head of Hydra. So we will put Venus in horizontal Virgo and Saturn in Cancer, in the astronomical column. We will put a seven kingdom alliance and a ten region military in the historical column. In verse 4, we read, quote, And his tail swept away a third of the stars from heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, in order that whenever she gave birth to her child he could devour it. End quote. This is clearly a reference to a meteor shower which we will place into the astronomical column, and in the historical column, we will make a note of, royal hostility, to the birth of the child. In verse 5, we read, quote, And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is going to shepherd all the nations with an iron rod, and her child was snatched away to God and to his throne. End quote. Here we come to the famous rapture text, that has nothing to do with the rapture. The astronomical information John has previously given us astronomically dates the coming of this event in history. It is the birth of a child who will change the course of history. But just before the child finally consolidates power, it will be taken in death to God's throne in heaven. Here we have to stop for a moment and examine the Greek word, translated as child, because it is a little more specific in Greek, than what we have in English. There were several words in Greek, for child, that described the different phases of the growth of a child, into adulthood. Some words referred to a newborn baby, some referred to a toddler, some referred to a preteen or teenager. The Greek word technon, used in this text refers to the preteen to teenager phase, of childhood. It is the last phase of childhood right before a male child becomes a full-grown man. It is from 10 to 17 years. So we will make a note of that in the historical column. What the child creates in the earth will end between 10 to 17 years. We should see some kind of astronomical activity in Virgo as a sign of this event, and we also see from verse 4, that Saturn should also be seen in Virgo, symbolic of the dragon ready to devour the child. So we will make a note of that in the astronomical column as well. This concludes our analysis for the first prophecy in Revelation chapter 12 verses 1 through 5. Now that we have our astronomical dating information, we can construct the historical timeline for this prophecy. As you recall from chapter 10, verse 11, after prophesying about the coming of the Bible in the common language, John was told he was going to have to prophesy about many nations. Quote, And they said to me, It is necessary for you to prophesy again about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. End quote. Rapturists have nowhere to go with any of this because their interpretation of Revelation is all about the end of the world and Israel. And all within just seven years. And pretty much, nothing else. But the historic interpretation shows John prophesying about many nations and kings, plural, precisely as the text describes. Because that is precisely what John is really doing. In chapter 11, you saw John cover the coming of the Reformation and the restoration of the nation of Israel. In chapter 12, John is having a flashback to chapter 11, verse 7, where he talks about the beast waging war against the Reformation, referenced prophetically, as the two witnesses. Just as he referenced the Lollards as the seven voices. 
The reason we know this is a flashback to verse 7 is because he picks up the narrative about the war against the Reformation in verse 7 of chapter 12. Same verse different chapter. Describing the same thing. It is a flashback. But this fact is not just a guess or speculation. It is astronomically dated by John's descriptions. If you are just making stuff up, it will not fit as very specific astronomical descriptions. If we look into the sky around this same time in history as chapter 11 verse 7, which we know to be sometime between 1584 and 1632, we will find in the sky, the exact occurrence of John's double sign. Virgo in the birthing position with Venus, clothed in the sun, with the moon under her feet. Here is the occurrence of the astronomical event. As you can see, the 30-year cycle of Saturn is positioned directly over the head of Hydra, precisely as John describes. If we look to the left, to Virgo, you can see the two-year cycle of Venus positioned in the womb of Virgo, precisely as John describes. You can also see, the moon is positioned under her feet, as John describes. And you can see, she is clothed in the sun. And this occurs in the year 1592. So we know that that is the beginning of the historical timeline for the first prophecy in Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 5. John has described astronomical positions which occur in the year 1592. This is a very rare synchronized moment in the astronomical clock because Saturn's circuit through the constellations is 29.5 years. Almost a 30-year circuit. And synchronized with that is not only Venus, that takes two years, but the position of both the Sun and the Moon, and the tilt of Virgo into the birthing position, horizontal in the sky. The chances are very small that all these things would line up and appear precisely as they are described in John's texts in verses 1 through 3. And in verse 2 John describes the woman being tortured, and this period of history, places us right in the middle of the Inquisitions. Next on our astronomically dated timeline, in verse 4, we have the description of a major meteor shower having to do with the dragon, which we know to be Hydra. If we go forward in time to a meteor shower matching the image of the dragon sweeping stars away with his tail, we will discover in 1593, the very next year, which are in reality only weeks away from the first event. The occurrence of the cratered meteor showers, which are positioned exactly where John says they will be, in the tail of the dragon. So this sets the date for verse 4 in 1593. These astronomical events, were John marking the beginning of his timeline, for the occurrence of his first prophecy, in Revelation 12. If we take the year 1593 and add our value of 6 years, from the period of labor, to the time of birth in verse 5, that should give us the year 1599. But remember, John is using redundancy in his timeline constructions. So if you just make something up, it will contradict his astronomical descriptions. And according to what he describes in verse 5, we should find that 30-year cycle of Saturn positioned precisely in Virgo as John described, positioned to devour the child. When we look into the sky in 1599, we find exactly what John has described. Saturn is indeed positioned in Virgo and there is an astronomical event right next to Saturn, indicating the birth of the child. If you look closely, you can actually see the stars, being given birth to. The stars are going to become a major part of John's prophetic narrative, as you will see when we get to the third prophecy, in chapter 12. And remember this event is occurring on exactly April 22nd, 1599 AD. But John's one verse begins with the birth of the child, from the woman of the olive wreath of twelve stars, and goes all the way through his life, to its end, when he is taken to heaven. While we do not know who or what this child represents at this point, we do know his rule is cut short between 10 to 17 years. And then he is taken to heaven. So what is this prophecy? Who is this child? And why is this so important in history? We will answer those questions next. Now we come to the historical fulfillment of John's first prophecy in chapter 12. The importance of this first prophecy will not be fully seen, until you see the third and final prophecy for chapter 12. The first prophecy, however, will set up everything that follows, in the rest of the chapter's prophecies. 
As you saw previously in Chapter 10 and Chapter 11, John uses both astronomic and linguistic symbols, to prophesy literal historic movements, peoples and events. In the case of the Greek word Ablaridian, you saw John prophesy the coming of the Bible. And as use of the symbol of the seven voices, you saw John make reference to the Lollards which meant to mumble with the voice, and has seven founders precisely as John had prophesied. And you remember that the Counter-Reformation enemies of the Lollards, are the very ones who gave them the name, Lollard, that identified them in John's prophecies. And as use of the symbol of the two witnesses, you saw John refer to the coming of the Protestant Reformation which was begun by the witnesses of Calvin and Luther, and by which all Protestants were called in an attempt to denigrate them. But ironically, fulfilling the very biblical prophecies, about them. When we come to the symbolism in chapter 12, you are going to see that John has repeated this technique again. He has prophesied the coming of a movement which would change the course of Western history. He specifically prophesies the very name of the leader of the movement. What it does in history, and even the derogatory name, the Counter-Reformation chose to call it. And once again, the very same derogatory name, the Counter-Reformation chooses to call them, makes them the unmistakable reference, of John's prophecies, in Revelation. When we look at the symbolism presented in verses 1 through 5, we see a woman with a circle over her head. The circle is made up of stars. And John refers to it as a Stephanos customarily made up of olive leaves, to signify the birth of a male child. That round shape, over the woman's head, is an unmistakable visual reference, in the heavens. Just as John referred to the coming of John Wycliffe and the Lollards, as the seven voices. So what does this first prophecy, actually refer to, in history? Well let's find out. If you take the main elements of John's prophecy, 1599, birth, olive, 12, and war, and type it into a Google search bar, here is what it produces. On your screen is a screen capture, of its results page. As you can see on the results page, the very first two results are the same reference, to someone named Oliver Cromwell. If you remember, the sign that appeared in the sky in 1599, appeared on April 22nd. It turns out, that this person, was actually, born on April 25th, 1599, literally just two days later. But that's not all. Cromwell, whose first name was literally, Oliver, like the round olive leaf Stephanos, John made reference to over the head of Virgo, became the leader of a movement in England, referred to in a derogatory manner as, the round heads. Yes, you heard that correctly, the round heads. As in a circle, head. Just like the circle you see over the head of Virgo. The round heads were called that because they cut their hair short around the top of their head to show their rejection of the monarchy. If you remember, back in Chapter 9, the tradition of kings wearing their hair extra long, went back to the Regis Creniti of the Byzantium and Holy Roman Empire. In imitation of the Apollo Christ hybrid, created by the Roman Empire, which precisely as John had prophesied in Chapter 9, had the hair of women. The Puritans openly rejected the claims of the divine right of kings, or in other words, the Regis Creniti, and as a way to show that rejection, they cut their hair short. Their critics thought they would make fun of this practice, just as they did when they coined the term Lollards, by calling them round heads. Little did they know however, they would be marking these people for eternal honors, just as they had done with the Lollards, before them. So now, every time you see the Catholic image of the Virgin Mary with a circle of stars around her head, supposedly from Revelation chapter 12, you can think, round head, which is precisely what that circle around the head, actually prophetically represents, in Revelation chapter 12. Once you have the reference point in history of Oliver Cromwell's birth, everything else in John's prophecy fits exactly into place, perfectly, and we now have the details of John's astronomically dated time frame on the historical timeline and it looks like this. We have the double signs of Rigo and Hydra marking the beginning of the timeline in 1592. We have the stars being swept away by the tail in 1593. We have the birth in 1599. And then we have the coming of the round heads in 1642, which Oliver Cromwell leads in the Puritan Revolution in England, culminating in the replacement of the monarchy, with the first Western Republic, in 1649. Precisely as John prophesies his republic, last only a little more than a decade, when Oliver Cromwell dies, and is taken to heaven. Shortly afterwards, 
the Republic ends, and the dragon returns. Why is the King of England referred to as the Red Dragon? Because that was literally the royal banner of the King of England, who as the future reigning king is always referred to as the Prince of Wales. And the Red Dragon, is actually, literally his very end sign. But that's not all, the kingdoms that make up his realm, are precisely seven, as in the seven heads of the dragon. And if this were not all enough already, the military regions within these seven kingdoms, are divided into precisely ten military regions, governed by ten generals, or in other words, the ten horns, of the seven-headed dragon. So this prophecy could not be more specific if John had been personally alive and present in 1599 to see it all, and write what he did. And as John prophesied about the seven voices being the Lollards because they had seven founders, and the Reformation as the two witnesses because it was begun by two witnesses, so too, John prophesied the twelve stars because, the round heads had twelve clergy, which were literally illustrated, in the circle, you see on your screen, who were persecuted by the English monarchy, for their stands against the Antichrist. So we even have the twelve, of the twelve stars, in the circle, fulfilled in the same way we had the seven founders of the Lollards. But we are not finished with this symbol, of twelve stars just yet, as you will see. It will become the most obvious symbol in all of John's prophecy, before it is over. So what did Oliver Cromwell, and the round heads do, that merited his mention in John's prophecies across the ages? During the short rule of Oliver Cromwell, and the round heads, Many historic things were accomplished for the first time in history since the coming of the Antichrist in Chapter 9. For the first time in European history, the monopoly the Vatican held on the European monarchy was openly fractured by a new form of government that recognized the authority of no king but Christ. The Vatican's Roman Catholic European megalith, now resident in the Spanish Empire, was defeated by Oliver Cromwell and the Round Heads. The very first prototype of a modern Western Republic, in which there was a separation of church and state, was created during his rule. And Oliver Cromwell became such an admired figure during the same time, they actually offered him the throne of England. Which he turned down, in order to establish the first modern republic. How many leaders would turn down an offer of monarchy, in order to establish, a new form of government, in the world, where religious freedom and liberty of conscience would be its goal? That was an unparalleled humility in the world at that time. The monarchal lineage of Charlemagne the Great, came from just such an event, when he stepped in and replaced the last of the Merovingian kings in France. Oliver Cromwell however, would do no such thing. He turned down the monarchy, to establish liberty. And it would set off a chain of events, which would lead to one of the greatest accomplishments in history. And far outlive, his life. Oh. And yes, Oliver Cromwell and the Round Heads, also were the first government in Europe, to grant its people, freedom from compulsory Christmas laws, officially sponsored by the government. While people were still free to observe their worship of the image of the beast, otherwise known as Christmas, in their homes, the new Republican form of government would spend no tax money, on sponsoring its promotion or enforcement, in the country. It was the establishment of religious freedom of England, you will hear many negative things about Oliver Cromwell from the Counter-Reformation. They literally despise Oliver Cromwell. And that is precisely, why John makes a point of prophesying his coming. Precisely as he did. The dragon still, to this day, wants to devour the birth of this child. But as John prophesies in the upcoming texts, God is going to have the victory, over the red dragon. And it is going to be a victory, for the ages, thanks to Oliver Cromwell, and his round heads, seen in the circle of stars, over the head of Virgo. But this prophecy, is just the beginning, of what John is about to prophesy. And you will see that in the very next video, when we cover the second prophecy, of Revelation chapter 12. You will discover what the Great War really is, and why John is talking about the mouth of the dragon and the mouth of the lamb, and his strange references to the rivers. And of course, the stars over the head of Virgo. You will be amazed at how specific and accurate John's prophecies really were in history. And you will also see why the Counter-Reformation has punked American Protestants with comical claims about people flying through the sky, and magical bottomless pits, and zombies, and magic demon bugs. You will see how pitiful it is when Christians are deceived into these medieval explanations to hide the beauty and power, of John's real prophecies, in the book of Revelation. 
You will also see how sad it is, that they have been deceived about the Antichrist, and into the worship of his image, in the practice of Christmas, which they have been fraudulently and deceptively told, is actually a Christian holy day. When in reality, it is the worship of the image of the beast, and the season of the dead, as John clearly identifies it, and his prophecies in Revelation. In this video, you have seen that John's astronomical dating, for the beginning of Revelation chapter 12, places it, beginning in the year 1592, and proceeding to the year 1599, with the birth of Oliver Cromwell, and the rise of the Round Head Revolution, in Europe. A movement which established Europe's first modern Western democracy. Although, it was short-lived, with the death of Oliver Cromwell, just a little after a decade, of its establishment. Thus John's use of the term technon in his text. In the next video we will examine the second prophecy of chapter 12, where the woman flees into the wilderness for safety from the red dragon, and war breaks out between Michael and the red dragon. Setting up the final part of John's prophecy in the third prophecy. As you have seen already, chapter 12 has nothing to do with the end of the world, anyone flying through the sky, or the Virgin Mary as the Queen of Heaven. All quite to the contrary. Revelation 12, is actually about events, which will ultimately bring about modern civilization. And will become the basis, of some of the most cherished liberties, and freedoms, we have today, in the Western world. Don't miss the next exciting episode, of Revelation chapter 12. You will be amazed, by what you will discover. Thank you for watching.